Welcome to my new show, The Graveyard Shift. This is where I will be sharing the creepiest paranormal events sent into the swamp every single week by viewers of the show. You can submit your story, as always, at swampdweller.net, or you can find an email in the description of this show. You can also go to reddit at r slash thedarkswamp and submit a story there. Now, this story will be mainly based around people working and having unexplained creepy events happening, but some of these stories may revolve around other things outside of work, but they will always be in the paranormal theme. As always, I appreciate you guys so much for supporting the swamp. If you can, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps us out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube pushes it to a brand new audience. Subscribe if you're new. We're always growing the swamp here, and we always have new episodes coming out. Now, welcome to your first night on the Graveyard Shift. This happened long ago and I just remembered this whole thing. At the time, I was just a kid, so I was just in my room playing with toys, and it was almost time for bed. My mom usually came in after putting my brother to bed, so I just was waiting for her. My door at the time was wide open. Suddenly, I saw a tall, dark silhouette of a human walking across the hall. I assumed it was my mom who was going to my brother's room, so I kept minding my business. But just about 30 seconds after I saw the silhouette get down the hall, I heard my brother's door open and my mother stepped out into the corridor. When she got to my room, I was confused and asked her if she had just walked down the hall. She said, No, I've been in Jack's room for about 10 minutes. That meant... She couldn't have been in the hallway when I saw the silhouette, and I know people will say it was just a trick of the light or my six-year-old imagination, but I don't think that's what it was. My mom saw things in my room when I was a baby, and they made her scared. The things eventually went away after praying about it. I'm religious and believe in the paranormal. I wasn't afraid or creeped out at the moment, but I was confused and wondering for an answer. But looking back on it years later, I still have no explanation for the figure in the hallway, and it still disturbs me. Anyone who's ever worked a night shift job will tell you it eventually gets old. I remember being really excited about starting my first night shift job. I thought it would be so cool, like that episode of Spongebob with the hash slinging slasher or something like that. It was nothing like that at all. In fact, it got plain old and repetitive pretty quickly. I am a man, and I'm a nurse, I know, people think that's weird, and I have been working in a hospital nearby. It was a long commute and extremely unbearable. Once I finished my contract with this hospital, which was about a year long, I decided to apply for another job, one that was a little less stressful and disorganized. I got a job at a job psychiatric unit. Working with children with mental illnesses seemed to be like a really cool job. Well, maybe cool isn't the right word, but meaningful. The hospital left me with this feeling of trying to save people who were going to die anyway. But with these kids, I could make a real difference that might turn their life around or find a way to let them cope with whatever is wrong with them. I was all around excited about it. The pay was even higher, which excited me as well. The only problem was that the only shift available was the night shift. The hiring manager told me there might be a day shift position available within a couple of months, and I would be the first one to get it if it opened up. But that was about all I was promised. So there I was helping kids at night. The only problem was is that most of them were asleep for the most part. I only got to do anything when one of them woke up or started misbehaving. This very quickly became the most boring job I have ever worked in my life, until the strange things started happening. About a month went by when something moderately frightening happened. It was a night like any other. I was sitting at my desk charting some stuff I had done with the kids earlier that night. I heard a noise that I didn't quite recognize at first. 
At first, it sounded like some kids maybe were wrestling or something. But maybe it was in the bed. I got anxious and did not want to walk in on some mentally handicapped kids doing the do, if you know what I mean. Call me cynical, but that's where my mind went immediately. But when I got in there, I saw something. I don't think I can ever unsee. I turned on the light to see one of the older kids trying to smother another one. The kid who was doing the smothering had no previous incidents of violent behavior. I didn't personally know these kids well enough because I didn't work with them during the day. But I knew their cases well enough that the kid doing the smothering had bipolar disorder. It was pretty severe, but he had never had a violent outburst like this. It was incredibly unusual. I immediately pulled him off the other kid and he started fighting me. He reached around his head and punched me in the nose at a weird angle. This kid must have been 11 or 12 years old and I was honestly surprised at how much force he had behind his punch. He didn't break my nose or anything, but he bloodied it up. My adrenaline kicked in after that and I had to restrain him, but you know, with the adrenaline, that wasn't much of a problem. I called for a nurse from another unit in the building to come over and assist me. It felt like we were waiting forever for this other nurse, but she got over within just a few minutes. The entire time I was waiting though, I couldn't help but look at this little kid who had nearly murdered another kid. When the other nurse got over, we gave him some medication that would knock him out and put him to sleep. I asked the other nurse, Carla, what I was supposed to do. She was there for a few years before me, and I assumed she would have a good answer. We just did everything we can do. Violent outbursts don't get kids thrown out of here. I was honestly shocked. I argued with her a little bit, but that was that. I tried talking to the kid who was being smothered, and he didn't have a whole lot to say about it. He said he didn't know the other kid that well, but they never had a negative incident until that night. This was a few years back now, and I cannot ever forget how I almost watched that kid die. If I had just been a few minutes later, he probably would be dead right now. It was not long after that experience that I decided to start looking for a new job. I got one a few weeks later and did my best to explain the situation to my case manager. She did not seem to understand or care, but that's not my problem anymore. I worked the overnight shift at an animal shelter almost 20 years ago. I know that's a long time ago, but something happened one night that is burned into my memory. I can recall the whole thing like it was yesterday. The textures, the smells. I've carried it with me for nearly two decades. My shifts were from 11 at night until 7 in the morning. A solid 8 hours of sleeplessness that ground me down throughout my time there. Night shifts can be good for you if you need the money, or even better if you're antisocial, but the lifestyle grinds you. Put it this way, I have a total vitamin D deficiency after 6 months of working there. It's not a healthy way to live by any means. The animal shelter itself was a big place, a horseshoe shaped building complete with a waiting area, a series of offices, a medical examination room, and hundreds of kennels and cages. Aside from once a week when the overnight cleaning staff were there, I spent all of my shifts alone behind a shelter reception desk, which gave me direct line of sight to the security glass of the shelter's front doors. My only duties were to monitor the emergency phone line, check on the animals now and then, and do some basic filing. I'd pack a few snacks and sandwiches for when I got hungry mid-shift, and every so often I'd call up the 24-hour pizza joint a few miles away and get them to deliver a box of hot, cheesy joy to push me through the night. Sure, the hours really sucked, but working at an animal shelter gave me a great deal of freedom, and it paid fairly well. It was way better than any of the nightly porter jobs I had seen advertised. It was a pretty happy time, so I remember this story well. It was such an odd event in an otherwise joyful time. So anyway, on the rare occasion that someone would come in, it was to drop off a stray animal they had found or that they could no longer care for. The shelter was always happy to take them in and make them comfortable. Being the first point of contact with many of these animals was nice. Many were nervous or scared, and calming them down with treats and petting them was one of the more fulfilling things. Words can't really describe it. I made a lot of furry friends during my employment at the shelter. 
I should add that the only exception to the shelter's rescue policy applied to fighting dogs or feral cats. As heartbreaking as it is, dogs that have been trained and conditioned to fight other animals are more often than not hopeless cases. Even if they're sweet and well-behaved around humans, if other animals or even small children aren't safe around them, they have no real hope of adoption, and most tend to be euthanized, which is something so sad I can't even bring myself to write about. But even as hard as those cases are, what happened that night was much, much worse. It was just past three in the morning when I finished smoking a cigarette outside and was returning to my desk. It was one of those quiet fall nights where the silence seemed to hang heavy in the air. So I heard the sound of footsteps coming quite a way away. A woman was sprinting full pelt down the sidewalk towards the shelter's front entrance, banging on the glass and buzzing the intercom repeatedly as she reached the doors. As I moved to greet her, I noticed that her cheeks glistened with fresh tears. Something terrible was happening. I hurried to unlock the glass doors trying to remain calm as I asked her how to help. She didn't really answer the question at first, which is unusual. Usually, the first thing a lot of people would mouth was that they have a thousand questions about adoption, what shots an animal might need, etc. All she asked is if she could come inside. She didn't have an animal with her, so I was suspicious about why she was there. Nevertheless, I'm not one to turn away an upset person, so I invited her inside, gave her some tissues to dry her eyes, and proceeded to get more information from her. She calms down eventually, and she tells me she needs to get her cat back. This was a problem since I couldn't return any interred animals without the proper signatures and paperwork, all of which was locked in the office that one of the resident veterinarians had, and there was no way I could return her animal especially not in the middle of the night. She'd have to return during regular hours to talk to one of the vets. When I tried to explain this to her, things started to go downhill. To my absolute horror, she explained that she came in earlier that day to have her cat put down. She had returned to clean the body to give her precious kitty a proper burial. Seriously, those were her exact freaking words. She's still in tears at this point. She's getting gradually more upset. Again, she's talking about her dead cat. I just wanted to get her out of here, so I didn't really know what to do. She didn't really seem very crazy at first, but the more I was around her, the more I gathered that she wasn't all there, if that makes sense. So, like a damned fool, I took a brief description and went looking around for her dead cat. The shelter keeps the bodies of euthanized animals in large blue plastic drums. You know, the type of kind where chemicals are kept in plastic lids. These blue drums, in turn, are kept in a vast walk-in freezer where the shelter's basement normally is. I gained access to the room in question, opened the freezer, and began to look for whichever barrow had been sealed the previous day, finding it was the easiest part of the whole process. As I pulled off the black plastic lid, the smell hit me. Even when frozen, the animals still gave off this faint, sickly smell of decay. Throw a load of them into the same plastic drum and the stink gets intense. I had to sift through scores of twisted frozen corpses, laying them down on the cold metal floor of the walk-in and studying them to find one that matched the woman's scant description. Eventually I did find the cat that seemed to fit the description, I, I had been given, but there was one thing. The cat was frozen solid and was stuck to another dead cat. I tried pulling them apart with my bare hands and it was no good, I needed something else for leverage. So I put the frozen mess of bodies in the freezer floor put a foot on one of the cats and tried to proceed to peel them with a horrific snapping sound. I nearly puked when I had seen what I had done. Many of the cat's frozen flesh had been torn from the stuck partner, keeping hold one that was... yeah, the one that was supposed to be the crying woman. I threw the other one back in the plastic drum, found an opaque plastic bag and returned it to its former owner. She seemed happy enough and tried to hug me as she was leaving, but I didn't feel like it was worth it. The whole thing left a terrible taste in my mouth. I have no idea what she was going to do with the dead cat, even if she did assure me that she was just going to bury it. Sometimes, even today, I wonder what happened to that woman and how many cat corpses her apartment is stuffed with. I would like to start by saying that while I am interested in the paranormal, I tend to be skeptical and prefer to think things out rationally before dismissing every little thing as a ghost or the like. 
This experience, however, has no logical explanation I can think of. I am new here, and as well, I apologize in advance if I'm not doing this correctly. So, let's get into this. I was 17 and it was mid-October, nearing Halloween. My family had gone to a small rural town to meet up with some good friends. We were going to get dinner and catch up for old time's sake as my siblings and I had grown up with the children of the other families. After dinner, the parents stayed at the bar drinking, and those of us who were not of legal drinking age were starting to get a little bored. That is when one of my friends brought up the local cemetery. Apparently, there is a cemetery in this town that is said to be haunted. I'm pretty positive that some ghost hunter paranormal type show did an episode about it or something, but the legends are said to have been around since before that. The story goes that a group of teenage boys were wandering into the graveyard one Halloween night with the intention of causing trouble and maybe stirring up some spooky ghost action in celebration of Halloween. After messing around for a while with no unexplained phenomena, they decided to sit in on top of the mausoleum, which is basically just a big tomb built up around a coffin instead of burying it in the ground. They were about to call it quits and head home when suddenly, unseen hands seemed to push one of the boys off the top of the tomb and into the ground. All the boys were obviously scared and hightailed it out of there, all of them feeling an eerie, ominous energy following them around for weeks after the incident. There have also been numerous reports of orbs, headstones inexplicably moving or disappearing altogether, ghostly apparitions, inscriptions being changed, flashes of light, strange noises, the whole works. I, of course, was more than excited to check it out. We arrived at the cemetery well after dark, and one of my girlfriends, we will call her Emma, and I were the only two brave ones enough to go in. We hopped right out of the car, careful to be as inconspicuous as we could since we did not want the police showing up and ruining our ghost hunting experience. We headed toward the entrance. It was chilly and a bit windy, as autumn in Wisconsin tends to be. We gripped each other's hands and started down the gravel path. As soon as we passed the fence that surrounded the plot of land, everything seemed to get very still and very quiet. We could not even hear the wind anymore which was strange as it had been breezy as we got out of the car. It was so silent that even whispering in our steps in the gravel seemed, pun absolutely not intended, loud enough to wake the dead. Though there were no lights in or near the cemetery, there was enough moonlight filtering through the clouds to allow us to see well. We soon realized we had no idea where the fabled haunted mausoleum was, but kept walking anyway. We made a random left turn and lo and behold, there it was, about 30 yards or so in front of us. Surprisingly, we had great luck, right? Uh, I don't think so. As we approached, I began to feel almost an electric sort of energy in my fingers and hands, but I wrote this off as just nerves or something due to breaking the law. We reached the tomb, and this thing is absolutely huge. It was easily twice my height, at the very least and made of weathered gray stone with moss and lichen growing sparsely on it. We stare at it for a moment and Emma whispers, You should touch it. Being the big bad ghost hunter I am, I oblige. There is really nothing remarkable about the cool roughness of the stone, so I decide to take it a step further and hop up to sit up on the lip of the curved top of the thing. Again, nothing happens, so I jokingly whisper shout, If there's anyone here, any spirits or anything, come on out. After listening in silence for a second or two, I think, F it, and make my way to the very top where the kid is rumored to have been pushed off by ghostly hands. I have Emma snap a photo or two of me before climbing back down. Slightly disappointed by the lack of spooky encounters, we agree to head out and are about to do just that when we see a pair of headlights slowly creeping down the road that borders one side of the graveyard. We immediately assumed someone noticed us and called the cops, so we crouched down behind some bushes with the mausoleum directly to our left. Both of us are completely silent except for our breathing as we watch the vehicle slowly make its way down the street. I am watching its taillights turn the corner when I hear a low, creepy, menacing laugh coming from right behind me. It sounded so strange, like it was a few feet away but also right in my ear at the same time. I'm freaked out, 
and I'm about to chalk it up to adrenaline-induced hallucination, when Emma, who is standing to my left, whispers, Hey, did you hear that? My blood ran cold, as I slowly nod a silent, Yes, I did. I cautiously turn my head to one direction, and try to see if I can hear it. I kid you not. I didn't hear anything, but what I did see was a dark figure stand up from behind one of the headstones not ten feet away from us. I scream bloody murder and somehow end up on the ground as the next thing I know, Emma is pulling at my arm, shouting, We have to run! We need to get out of here! Come on! I let her pull me to my feet and lead me blindly by the hand. We are full out sprinting, tripping over gravestones and plants and who knows what else in the dark. We cannot even find the exit in our panic. We finally reach a gap in the fence and I can feel the tears streaming down my face as I run for my life down the middle of the road, not even paying attention to the oncoming headlights until I nearly run into them. Luckily it was the car containing the rest of our friends and we rip the door open and throw ourselves inside screaming, go, go, please just drive, before we even bothered to sit in an actual seat or shut the door. I cannot for the life of me remember who was driving, but I think our panic and terror shook them enough that they did exactly what we asked of them and sped away back to the bar. They kept asking us what happened and if we were okay, but we would not calm down enough to answer them until we were back inside the bar and sat down. Still shaking and out of breath, we recounted our story to all of them, drunk parents included. I think a lot of them were skeptical, and honestly, I would have been too if I had not experienced it myself. In the weeks that followed, I felt the same eerie energy the boys in the legend describe hanging over my head. Personally, I attribute it more to paranoia after being scared out of my mind by something I could not actually see, but it made me feel uneasy nonetheless. It has been a few years since this happened and I still cannot think of a single, logical explanation for what actually happened that night. While I have no idea how credible anyone else's reported experiences on this show are, I know we were without a doubt the only people in that graveyard, or even on the streets for that matter, and we would have heard someone trying to sneak up on us. The sound of that laugh was so unnatural. I cannot get it out of my head. Even now, I have never been more scared than I was that night. And I now know what people mean when they talk about not being able to fully believe in the paranormal until you have experienced it firsthand. Anyway, I just thought I would share this experience with you. I hope you enjoyed it. Two thousand nine, I was interested in the paranormal, since I had many paranormal experiences growing up. I found a website that held ghost tours at the old Southwestern General Hospital. I was excited and ready to go on a ghost hunt. The group that held the ghost tour was named Ghost, or Ghost Hunters of South Texas. The group was professional, and they used many of the items that paranormal researchers used at the time. Before the tour, they showed us proof that they have captured in previous investigations while investigating the property. EVPs included a little boy saying, play with me please and a woman with a southern accent responding to questions. The woman is said to be in an old-time dress and, sometimes, old-time nurse attire. After the tour, the group said they were having openings for new members, and the new members would be tested and would be considered and maybe being part of the new team. I was quick to join and try out. I made the team. The team would have private group ghost hunts, so we would have the building to ourselves. The third floor was used as a hospice type of area. The building has four floors. The first, second, and fourth floor were left abandoned, and they look like a scene out of a horror movie. Hospital beds lay in rooms dusty and unused. Many had dates from 1995 and before. I even found a death log that had many names and dates. The most active areas were the fourth and second floor. The fourth floor had a baby nursery in many rooms that were once used for families that would be welcoming new babies. One EVP that was caught in that area was one of crying babies. At the time the EVP was caught, there were no babies in the building, and it was after midnight sometime when it was caught. Also on the fourth floor, there was a long hallway with empty patient rooms. In that hallway, shadows were always seen running or moving. 
The second floor was an old area. Also, many shadow figures were seen in this area. When doing research on the deaths in the building, I came up with what looked like to be a nurse who was crushed to death when a malfunction with the elevator happened years ago. During the time I was a part of this group, we investigated this building tons of times. I might even care to say maybe over a hundred. I also led ghost tours in the building with other members. I witnessed shadows, disembodied voices, screams, and one time heard a female humming a song only to find the room empty and dark. I've seen videos of doors opening on their own with no wind or people in the building. Also, the third floor had employees that would see things and hear things very often. Patients also complained of a kid running in their room or a man standing over their bed just looking at them, only to disappear. Over the years, I gained experience and loved what I did. As a group, we investigated many places such as schools, homes, and cemeteries in El Paso. We also got to investigate the old Asarco smelter before it was demolished several years later. I got to ghost hunt with people from Ghost Hunters and Ghost Hunters International. I met many celebrities and the group had them take their own personal ghost tours. It was fun and I grew a thick skin for fearing anything that goes bump in the dark. One of my favorite places to investigate was Southwestern General Hospital. I never believed in being followed home. One night after investigating, I was at my apartment eating on my couch and watching TV. I had my hallway light on near the front door that was visible from where I was sitting. Suddenly, from the corner of my eye, I saw a shadow of a person on the wall near the door. I turned and saw the shadow in full form. It was about six foot tall and completely black. Then, not even a second later, the shadow moved as if it was running down my hallway to my bedroom. I froze in horror, thinking somebody was in my apartment. I got up and walked to my bedroom. Nobody was there. I searched the whole house up and down, and then I thought to myself, Maybe I'm just going crazy. I soon went to bed a few minutes later. It was probably about 3.20 a.m. when I felt my bed shaking. I woke up to my sheets being pulled off me very slowly and deliberately. I tried to move, but I just could not. My sheet slid very slowly off me towards the floor. I could not move, and I started to hear growling in my right ear. From the corner of my eye, I could see something moving near my head on the right of me. It was on my pillow. I can only see it from the peripheral vision that it had hair. It was hairy and brown. If I could compare it to something, I would say Chewbacca from Star Wars type hair. It was moving, very slowly, but obviously very deliberately. It was growling as well. My eyes started to water up with tears. I tried to move my arm, but I just couldn't. I could only move my fingers. The blanket was still being pulled off me little by little until it hit the floor and I was no longer covered by my sheet. I felt the hairy thing moving right next to me and the growling grew louder. Then suddenly, I was able to sit up and I turned and looked to see what was there next to me. The hairy thing was gone, but I could see the imprint of where it had sat right next to me just a moment ago. It was the size of a full grown cat. Then I looked around the room to gather my sanity. I don't own a cat. My sheet was on the floor, and my eyes were still watery. I asked myself, maybe it was just sleep paralysis. I found it hard to sleep that night, since I lived alone in that apartment. The next day I had a girl over to my apartment. I was seeing her from school. I was playing PlayStation and she asked if she could take a nap in my bed. I said of course. She went to my bed and fell asleep. Around 20 minutes later, she suddenly came back to my living room in tears. She said, uh, I have to leave now. I asked her what was happening and what was wrong. What she said shocked me. She said that something shook the bed and woke her up. She could not move, and then something was growling and started getting close to her ear. Then the bed went down as if somebody lied down next to her. She tried to scream for me and could not. Then she felt as if somebody was breathing on her neck as the growling grew louder. She said it lasted about two minutes, and then she was finally able to move. Once she was able to move, she ran to me in the living room. After she explained this, I grabbed her stuff and helped her leave. I did not tell her what happened to me the night before, but I had that same exact experience.
and what happened to her was enough proof that something was not right. I could not explain what was happening. First thing that came to mind that something probably followed me home from the hospital. After a few days, all the activity suddenly stopped. Only when I would go in on investigations, I would see shadows in my apartment, and then they would just go away. I loved what I did, and the only time I feared the paranormal was this moment. I no longer ghost hunt, and the group no longer gets together. Southwest General Hospital was purchased and is now remodeled and is in use. I can only imagine what the employees of the LTAC go through by being in that building. Every now and then I drive down Cotton and pass the building. I miss the days of being part of Ghost El Paso. If you are ever in El Paso after stopping by at Chico's Tacos, be sure to pass by the old building by the Star on the Mountain, formerly known as Southwest General Hospital. And with that, we have clocked out for our first time on the Graveyard Shift. If you enjoyed these stories, be sure to hit that like button. It helps me out a ton with the growth on this channel. If you're new, be sure to subscribe as it helps me out a ton as well. We upload brand new episodes multiple times a week. We'll have brand new episodes of The Graveyard Shift every single week moving forward from now on. Hopefully you enjoyed this show, and if you have stories to share, be sure to send in your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. You can also submit them on r slash the dark swamp. I'd love to share your story with everyone here. Thank you guys so much for supporting the swamp the way you do. I couldn't do this on a daily basis without you all. I'll see you soon with another episode of The Graveyard Shift.